just like with every other subject, the anarchy or chaos of the gender debate nowadays is yet another opportunity, a ripe opportunity, to appreciate how Islam has the perfect solution for every dilemma mankind will ever face. You know, everyone speaks about gender equality and then the Quranic or Islamic narrative says, actually, you're overlooking something. There is a superior notion known as gender equity. You know, Islam recognizes men and women as equal. It does in that they're equally human, right? They're equally dignified. They're equally inviolable. You can't violate a woman the same exact way you can't violate a man. They're equally... Uh, purposeful. We are all created with the same pur purpose to devote our lives to Almighty God. We are equally given the opportunity to race for the highest ranks of paradise. So the most important things, equality is there. But then Islam says, wait, there are some differences and it would be unfair to overlook them. And so part of fairness, equity to both parties is to recognize the unique strengths and the unique contributions of each gender. That's why, for example, Islam says, your mother, then your mother, then your mother, then your father. Why? Does the mother deserve, in full fairness, three times as much kindness? Because she's been more kind and compassionate with you than anybody else. She was more empathic. She <laughs> carried you all by herself. And she delivered you all by herself. And she nursed you pretty much all by herself. Then the rest of us got involved. And so it is perfect fairness, perfect justice. And if we don't celebrate the unique contributions of each gender the way Islam taught us to, then the drilling outside of the other narrative will cause each gender to become dissatisfied with their unique, distinct strength and skill and contribution. Even if we were the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, this is not just like a, a risk of the modern times, even if it may be so prevalent now. Because even among the Sahaba, you have someone like Asma bint Yazid ibn Sakan al-Ansariya, who was a brave, articulate woman known for, for many accolades. They say that in, during the Battle of Al-Yarmouk against the Byzantines, well after the Prophet's death, she took out nine men with the pole of her tent when the tent was overrun, like the medical tent, the aid tent. She took them all out. She finished them. But during the time of the Prophet wasallam, there's a famous incident regarding this discussion of gender equity. She says, Ya Rasulullah, Allah sent you to both the men and the women. And we've believed in you, and we've believed in your Lord. So where now is our share of the reward? Because we are homebound. We are, make ourselves available for our husbands. We bear their children for them. While they are outside, they get to attend Jumu'ah, meaning more often than us, because women are allowed to attend Jumu'ah, of course, right? They get to attend Jumu'ah. They attend the Jama'ah, the congregation. They get to visit the sick, meaning more often. They get to attend the janais, the funeral processions. We have more limitations than them. They get to perform hajj, he said. They get to perform umrah. And above all, they get to perform jihad. To fight in the path of God, sacrifice their lives. So of course, all the companions are listening like, whoa. <laughs> Look at how this woman can really make a case. How articulate, how confident, how... And so the Prophet ﷺ said to her, listen to me carefully and take, communicate this message back to all of the women whom you represent. You are their spokesperson. Take this back to them. That you fulfilling with excellence your wifely duties, right? And you being keen on taking care of your family and pleasing your husband will get you the reward of all of that. Everything the guys are doing outside. So she said, all of that, all of that. She turned around and walked away saying, Allahu Akbar, God is great. Great in his justice, great in his fairness, right? God is great, God is great. La ilaha illallah, she kept saying. There's no God but Allah. Allah is the true God. His equity is befitting of his greatness. It all lines up. You know, and you should also appreciate why is it 
that this function that a woman may serve when homebound is equal to the same reward as Jumu'ah and Jama'ah and visiting the sick and the Janazah and Hajj and Umrah and Jihad and why all that? Because would it actually be possible for the men to be out and about serving in that way in society and in the world if their homes were not anchored by the sacrifice of their partners? It would not have been possible. Therefore, it is perfect equity, perfect justice that they partake in the reward as well. Then there's another hadith, the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to the men now, he said, the money you spend on freeing a slave, imagine giving someone their freedom, emancipating a slave, and the money you spend on feeding a needy person, someone who's hungry, feeding a needy person, and the money you spend to sponsor a campaign fighting in the path of Allah, he says, and the money you spend on your family, the one that has the most reward is the money you spent on your family. How? Well, he said so, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's such a great reward. But why? Because it's equity. Think about it. Number one, spending on your family is a personal duty. If you don't do it, nobody's going to do it. Right? Number two, because it's a personal duty, it's less visible to the outside world. When you do do it, you're not going to be very appreciated. Like you spent in the past year on your family, oh men, maybe 50, maybe 100, maybe $200,000. You've never spent that much in a fundraiser. But still, that money behind closed doors, no one's going to tell you takbir, Allahu Akbar, may Allah bless your health and your wealth, brother. No one's going to do that. So Allah Azza wa Jal wants the homes to remain invested in by the men and the women. These are the, the building blocks of a healthy society. So he's saying, I appreciate you. If the world doesn't, I appreciate you. The world doesn't see it, I see it. But to be very honest and fair, there is a missing puzzle piece to this. In the hadith of Asma and the hadith of Abu Huraira, right? What's in it for us? We get the same reward and then the money I spend on my family is the most reward that will only be motivation enough for someone who's actually looking for reward, for looking for Allah's approval, right? They were satisfied with, oh, I get that reward. I, 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 they embrace that. They welcome that. But if Allah's pleasure is not the mission of your life, is not the priority for you, then I'll be like, no, I don't, so what if I get the same reward? I want the same celebrity. I want the same credit in the eyes of the people. And that is why fixing the relationship with Allah lies at the core of fixing any other relationship. Even fixing your relationship with yourself. Even your own self-image, your own self-confidence. But if you are able to be that person that Allah's pleasure and the reward of the hereafter is your number one priority, not only will these incentives keep you going, but also you will realize that it's actually the only thing possible is to get Allah's approval. The people's approval is impossible. Who has ever been approved of by everybody? And then you just, not even the Prophet ﷺ, not even Allah Himself. People debate about God, right? So you think you're going to get it? So focus on what's possible. And when you seek out Allah's pleasure, things become very simple in life. Things become very clear. Even in this gender discussion, not only is Allah going to be approving of me, but also for my sanity, I actually know what it looks like to do the right thing. You see, the gender role debates nowadays deflate people. It's so discouraging because I'm always being accused by somebody or some group that I'm brainwashed, that I'm underperforming, that I'm not living up to. I'm so backwards or Eastern or Western or old school or whatever it may be. But when you seek Allah's pleasure, it's right there in the Qur'an. You know, and I, because the bulk of those who attend Jumu'ah, because it is mandatory on us, is the males, I will spend the rest of the khutbah speaking to the males in particular. Do we have clarity on what masculinity is? Qur'anically? Absolutely. مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَعَاهَدُ اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِ Among humanity are true men. The the praise here is the quality, of course, not just the, the, the biological uh, condition. But true men, he, the, the context is praise. That what? That kept true to their contract, their covenant with God. 
and then you speak about on the interpersonal level, I'll share with you two ayat that give you such transparency on what I'm supposed to be doing here, how I'm supposed to be thinking about this. One ayah Allah says, الرِّجَالُ قَوَّمُونَ عَلَى nisa." Men are the maintainers of women, are the caretakers of women. Case closed, right? I am responsible financially for my family. That's a part of it. That's a part of my responsibility. I'm also responsible to protect my family physically. Clarity. That means I have to be, have the strength of body, right? Have strength of will, right? Courage. I have to accept this. This is my duty in life to protect my family. And also I have to maintain my family in terms of guiding them morally. I have to make those decisions. That doesn't mean micromanagement. That means being sort of the moral guide, the North Star, being the one who moves it in the direction of safety, in the direction of Allah's pleasure and His mercy, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that too I will embrace because it's the work of the prophets. I'm honored with my family and beyond. The other ayah was actually given by Sufyan ibn Uyayna, rahimahullah. Though the word manliness is not there, the way he, he understood this ayah was so insightful. Sufyan ibn Uyayna, one of the earliest, greatest Qur'an scholars, when they asked him, where is masculinity? Where is manliness in the Qur'an? He said, it is in the statement in Surah Al-A'raf. When Allah Azza wa Jal was speaking to the greatest man and the greatest model for manliness in humanity. He was speaking to the Prophet Sallallahu and he said to him, defining it for us through him, خُذِ الْعَفْوَ وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ Take what is available. Afw is like, Forgiveness, right? Take what they allow you to take. Meaning see the opportunities that are available, right? And be an agent of positive change in the world. That means a man is not allowed to feel powerless, to resign to that. A man is not allowed even to be oblivious, to not know what I'm supposed to be doing. You got to look for every available opportunity to influence the world in positive ways, beginning with those closest to you. That's your job. There are ways we can better ourselves and better our family, better our, our self-esteem and that of our loved ones today before tomorrow. But we might be oblivious. And also take what is available. In that is an indication that you need to be gradual and gentle, not forceful. Take what's available. Don't be lazy and so just haste in hasty ways, go home and try to tear it down after the khutbah. Right? That's part of being a man. Laziness causes you to be rash many a times impatience, lack of self-control, self-discipline. Take what is available. Be, be goal-oriented but calculated. Then he said, those three phrases in that verse on manliness, he said, وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And constantly be a promoter of goodness. That means leading by example. That means educating the world on goodness. That means encouraging the world to embody what they know to be good. All of it. You are an enjoiner, a promoter of goodness divinely dictated goodness. And the third of them, he said, وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ And ignore the foolish. Part of the burden of leadership is criticism. You're going to get a lot of criticism. Right? If you're appeasing everyone, that means you don't really stand for anything. Right? You haven't really done anything. You just made everyone feel like they're totally fine. Even if they're going to hell, you made them look forward to the trip. How man, that is cowardice. That is selfishness. A'rid an al means yes, hear feedback, listen to advice, but you're going to ignore criticism. You're going to be bent on your mission to do the good work, to fight the good fight. You're not going to be spiteful. You're not going to be jaded by them. You're also not going to be deflated by them. You're going to be a man of strength. And as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the man that has real strength is not the one that can physically out-wrestle others. That is a form of strength. Well, that's not real strength. The, one, the strong person is the one that has self-control and he gave the example of anger, like in the times when you're angry. And so the male will make the tough decisions. The man, not the male, should I say. Right? And they're going to ignore the noise. And so I want to say, in light of those ayat, right? Men are the maintainers here, and 
take what's available and enjoy what is good and ignore the critics. If you embrace that Quranic definition of leading, seeking to lead, seeking to be a force for good, then you are more manly. See how clear it is? That's it. You are more manly than the whole world that doesn't think so. You're infinitely more masculine than those who don't know the definition of masculinity or have shallow definitions of masculinity. People think masculinity today is, you know, selling your body on the internet, really. You know, what kind of muscle mass I can take a photo of at the right angle within a bathroom. That's masculinity. That's selling your body. That's what it is. Or masculinity may be in some times and places how many children I can produce or how much wealth I can amass. Allah is a razzaq. You are deluded for thinking so. And some of the most corrupt think that an accomplishment is for them to outdo others in the amount of women they can deceive and supposedly attract in passing. You are infinitely more masculine than all of them because you're committed to the Quranic clarity. May we be of those people. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah al-azim li wa lakum. Alhamdulillahi wahdah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'd. Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa nabiyuhu wa rasuluhu. Today and forever, we as Muslims need to remember that only Islam can fix things in a wholesome way. Only Islam can reinstate in the world men that have that clarity and confidence. That can create also men, save the world you know, from men that are strong but take advantage of others because of their strength. Or save the world from men that are weak and cannot lead and effect positive change in those around them and in themselves. Only Islam can produce men and women that are upright parents, that will not subject their kids to lifetimes of suffering because they bicker like children, these parents, right? Only Islam can save us from all of that and every other dilemma that may arise. But that is not by hearing a khutbah about it here and now. This is a lifelong project to reacquaint ourselves with the Islamic worldview, to transcend these gender wars that could finish off humanity worse than any world war can. But also it requires systematic, systematic building. What I mean is, you know, again speaking to our brothers, there being healthy friendships between males, healthy male networks where we share experiences and bond with each other and realize we're not alone in this, the same way our women feel overwhelmed, we too feel overwhelmed by this unnatural dynamic of modern life, even places where we can be more physically active and physically fit, you know, the, the bottled upness of it is just one of the many problems of the blurring of the lines. And it's one of the reasons why suicide is three times more prevalent among males today than females, at least in the United States. And ultimately, and I close with this, this also requires part of the systematic solution is masjid presence. Because this challenge, a huge part of it is the fact that the village life is gone I don't mean the primitive nature of the village life. I mean the support system, the extended family systems in village life. Once we realize the need and how necessary these changes are, you start carrying the load for each other so that we can all get better. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us an obvious evident model for the solution that us and the world need. Say Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us be agents of positive change. The men and women amongst us, Allahumma Ameen. May we be not sucked into wars that are not ours. And misguidance that we already have the cure from in our hands, may it settle in our hearts and produce the best for us and this, in this world and the next. Allahumma ameen, ighfir lana warhamna ya rabbana.